Welcome back to, to this session on end-stage liver disease. Our expert speaker is going to be Lewis Roberts from the Mayo Clinic in the United States, who's going to present on the particularities of hepatocellular carcinoma in the African setting. Uh, Dr. Roberts is the uh, Professor is a professor in gastroenterology, uh, in cancer research, and a consultant in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic, where he is the director of the Hepatobiliary Neoplasia Clinic. It's a great pleasure to welcome him here today. Good morning or afternoon. Um, my name is Louis Roberts from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I would like to thank the conference organizers of CULDA um, 2020 for the opportunity to present to you on the particularities of HCC in Africa. I have a few um, disclosures um, which are shown on this slide. And what I thought I'd do with this presentation is um, talk briefly about the, what we know overall about the epidemiology of hepatocellular carcinoma, which I will abbreviate as HCC in African populations, talk about interventions for reducing the burden of HCC in Africa. And I'd like to end with a call for additional research on HCC in Africa and in populations of African descent. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that liver cancer is a major cause of cancer death worldwide. In terms of the main cancers that we see here in this slide, we have data from Global Can 2018, and it shows the cancer type um, in the first column and then the incidence, mortality, and mortality ratio in the subsequent columns. And as you can see, in terms of incidence, lung cancer has the highest incidence of cancer worldwide with over 2 million cases, closely followed by breast cancer, then colorectal, prostate, stomach, and then liver with around 840,000 in the Global Can 2018 estimate. But when it comes to mortality, you will notice that we have lung cancer first with about 1.76 million deaths per year. But then we have a near tie next after lung cancer with colorectal, stomach, and liver all having between 800 and 900,000 deaths per year. And in this um, particular estimate, liver happens to be number four in absolute numbers, but in other estimates that we have, it can range anywhere from number two to number four in terms of mortality worldwide. When it comes to mortality ratio, it's where we see um, really how lethal liver cancer is worldwide. So the mortality ratio is the number of people uh, the, pro the proportion of people who are diagnosed with cancer in a particular year who actually die of that cancer within the same year after diagnosis. So the deaths within a year after diagnosis. And you will see that among the major cancers, liver cancer is the most, le most lethal with 93% of people dying within a year of diagnosis compared to 80 4% in lung cancer and much lower rates um, for most of the other cancers. So why do we see um, high rates of liver cancer worldwide? A large proportion of the causes of liver cancer worldwide are due to chronic hepatitis B virus infection. Um, worldwide, this is followed by hepatitis C virus infection and then alcoholic liver disease. And then finally, we have a, a remarkable increase, particularly in Western nations and increasingly now also in um, the East of people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that is causing non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, cirrhosis, and liver cancer. So those are the four major causes of death from cancer and chronic hepatitis B virus infection and chronic hepatitis C virus infection are the two 
most common causes. Now, these are diseases that are highly prevalent in Africa and Asia. And this graph from the WHO shows you the estimates for chronic um, hepatitis B infection worldwide. And you can see that we have very high rates in um, the Pacific region, but also very high rates in Africa. And on a numerical basis, there's an estimated 115 million people in the Pacific region with chronic hepatitis B virus infection, about another 40 million in Southeast Asia, and then 60 million individuals in Africa with chronic hepatitis B virus infection. So if we look at the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma, which I will show on the next slide, we can see that globally, the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma mirror the map of chronic hepatitis B virus infection um, quite consistently. And so this shows you H standardized rates from the WHO, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, um, from above 14 per 100,000 person years and on down to less than 3.9 per 100,000 person years. And you can see that the largest rates occur in Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, the, air, the other area that is showing increasing numbers of cases of hepatocellular carcinoma or areas are uh, North America with the United States and portions of Europe actually having substantial proportions of hepatocellular carcinoma as well. I'd like to point out um, Egypt. Um, Egypt, as you are aware, um, has fairly high rates of chronic hepatitis C virus infection and um, has the highest rates of chronic hepatitis C in the world. And, and the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma in Egypt reflect this high incidence of chronic hepatitis C. But in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, we have variable, but in some cases, fairly high rates of chronic hepatitis C as well, um, with rates as high as um, 10 to 20% in some um, regions and communities. But I would say an overall rate more in the range of 2 to 4%, compared to rates of around 8 to 12% of chronic hepatitis B. So I think first it's important to insert a note of urgency into our discussion. Um, the epidemic of hepatocellular carcinoma in Africa is now. And many of you who are in this conference, I'm sure are aware of the fact that patients are presenting to see us with hepatocellular carcinoma they are almost uniformly presenting at late stages, and I will show you some information about this. Um, they typically will present with abdominal swelling, a palpable mass, or a bruit that you can hear sometimes um, with a stethoscope over the liver, and sometimes you can feel the thrill with your hand over the liver of these very vascular tumors of the, of the um, blood flow um, through the vascular tumors um, as they um, grow and develop. On the left side of this slide, you can see an ultrasound um, from an 18-year-old woman in Ghana with chronic hepatitis B virus infection, so patients can be quite young. And what I hope to do in this presentation is show you um, three um, studies briefly that highlight um, the burden and the need for um, care for these patients in Africa. So the first study is from our African Network for Gastrointestinal and Liver Diseases. And we first of all did a study of the age of onset of hepatocellular carcinoma in persons from multiple countries in Africa. And this map here shows you the countries um, that um, we included in this study. We had collaborators from Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, and Malawi. And um, this um, graph on the left shows you 
the age on the y-axis and the distribution of age of patients depending on the etiology of their liver cancer. So first we have hepatitis B virus induced um, liver cancers and you can see the median age was about 42 and you can see the range of ages um, in, in this, um, on this plot. Then on the, on the far left, we have in the fourth, um, on the fourth um, column, the hepatitis C virus induced cancers, and you can see the median age was about 55 years of age. And then we have on the second, um, the mixed hepatitis B, hepatitis C co-infected individuals. And you can see because they have hepatitis B, that appears to be dominant. And they're also mostly very young individuals with a median of about 43 years. And then we have a group of others for which there was no known etiology. And this appears to be a mixed group with some of them likely being hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or perhaps alcohol-induced cancers. If we look at age of onset of hepatitis B virus-associated HCC by country, you can see um, Malawi has the youngest age of onset around 30 um, six for the median age of onset. And then this was followed by Ghana, Nigeria, and Uganda with 40 years at, at the median age of onset. Tanzania with about 45 years, same with Ivory Coast, and then Sudan with um, nearly 60 years as the age of onset. So the peak age of hepatitis B virus associated HCC in Sub-Saharan Africa then is in the range of 35 to 40 years of age. And that's what this plot shows in the darker bars, the hepatitis B induced cancers, in the lighter gray bars, the hepatitis C virus induced cancers. And you can see how hepatitis B, we begin to see cases up to 20% of, of, of cases maybe before the age of 30. Then we see the peak of the majority of cases around the ages of 35 to 40. And then um, we continue to see cases going on up into the 70s and 80s. So what this reflects is the fact that if we are seeing this many cases occurring and people in their youngest, most productive um, parts of their lives, there's a huge burden of the disease and a lot of years of productive life lost from this disease. So the next study we wanted to do was look at outcomes of patients in Africa who um, had the diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. And for this study, we did an interesting analysis where we compared the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, which mostly was hepatitis B-induced cancers, with Egypt, which mostly has hepatitis C-induced cancers. The other distinction, of course, is that in part because Egypt has recognized hepatitis C and hepatocellular carcinoma as a major cause of cancer death for a number of years. There is been, there's been substantial effort um, devoted towards early detection of cancer, early detection of hepatitis, early detection of cancer, and treatment of cancer in Egypt compared to other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. So what this slide shows is the countries that were involved in, in the outcome study, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, and then um, in, East and, uh, in North and in East Africa, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania. And if we look at median survival of patients in Sub-Saharan Africa with hepatocellular carcinoma compared to patients in Egypt, we had approximately 1,200 patients um, in each group. Um, the, in this plot where we, we show you the information that we had of, on survival of the patients, we show you the number at risk at the bottom of the, of the plot. And you can see in these Kaplan-Meier plots that the median survival of patients who were diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma in Egypt was about 11 months, compared to a median survival in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa of approximately only three months. And if we compare this to the data that we have across the world, um, 
this data um, includes um, data from a study that we did um, looking at patients from major medical centers in other countries around the world. You can see the survival time in Taiwan is much better than um, in either Egypt or in Sub-Saharan Africa, with Taiwan and Japan showing the best survival in the darker blue and the um, red um, um, plots, the, the, the top two, while we have Egypt in the light blue and um, the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa in the light gray. And so we have what I call the surveillance gap, the difference between countries that have implemented comprehensive programs for identifying patients who are at risk for cancer, doing regular surveillance of these cancers, and doing effective treatment of these cancers um, for these patients, compared to our countries in Sub-Saharan Africa particularly, where there is often no effort to identify individuals who have hepatitis and are at risk for cancer. Few of those individuals get surveillance for cancer. And consequently, when they are diagnosed with cancer, it's often at an advanced terminal stage. So finally, I'd like to describe a web-based survey that we did of African providers to, to understand what the current local status is in Africa regarding um, hepatitis diagnosis, liver cancer diagnosis, and treatment. So we had 63 participants from 58 referral centers in 14 African countries. Um, many of these um, individuals were seeing between 1 and 20 patients each month with hepatella carcinoma, with a few individuals seeing substantially more. We had five people who were seeing more than 20 cases of hepatella carcinoma a week. In terms of their percentage of patients they were seeing at their centers who were receiving surveillance for cancer, you can see that 20 of the individuals or 32% said that 75% um, or more of the individuals they were seeing at their center were receiving surveillance. Um, on the other hand, 37% said almost no one, less than 25% of individuals seen at their center were receiving surveillance for hepatella carcinoma. In terms of those who received a diagnosis of hepatella carcinoma who had been under surveillance though, 76% reported that fewer than 10% of patients were under surveillance at the time of diagnosis. So this reflects the fact that individuals were coming to their clinics already with cancer. These weren't individuals who were under, previously under their care that they had the opportunity to institute surveillance for. So we asked the question then, how, what proportion of individuals that they were seeing with hepatella carcinoma already knew they had a, a diagnosis of viral hepatitis? And in the case of 62% of the providers, fewer than 10% of the liver cancer patients that they were seeing knew they had chronic viral hepatitis before their diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. What were the major barriers to hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance? The major barrier in 90% of cases was a lack of liver disease diagnosis. And then there was a lack of symptoms of chronic liver disease and poverty uh, was also ascribed as a major cause of lack of surveillance. Were there options for HCC treatment? Remarkably, in 56% of the centers, surgery was an option. In 40%, local ablation was an option. And in 30%, local regional treatment was an option. And then um, finally, what were the reasons um, for patients not having treatment of HCCs in 98% of the cases, it was because of the advanced stage of diagnosis. And this was, of course, complemented by um, issues with poverty in 60% of patients and in lack of clinical expertise for treatment in almost 60% of cases. So in conclusion, our web-based study showed that only a small proportion of HCC patients with underlying HBV are diagnosed with HBV or HCV for that matter before their diagnosis of HCC. 
This results in detection of HCC at an advanced stage at which no treatment can be offered. Population-based screening for HBV is therefore a critical strategy for identifying candidates for HCC surveillance. And this is true also for hepatitis C in those areas where hepatitis C um, has high prevalence. And we know that hepatitis, hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance can lead to earlier detection of HCC and improve the dismal clinical outcomes of HCC patients in Africa. So the keys to reducing deaths from HCC and the burden of illness in Africa are hepatitis B virus vaccination at, at birth and with a pentavalent vaccine to reduce the overall rates of chronic viral hepatitis. It's important to identify persons with chronic viral hepatitis. We need to identify and find the missing millions. We need to treat patients with hepatitis B virus who are eligible for treatment and all patients with hepatitis C virus as well. Address exposure to other factors that contributes to the development of hepatocellular carcinoma, such as aflatoxin and tobacco exposure, limits the other risk factors such as alcohol and obesity, encourage coffee consumption. This is the only thing that we know of in terms of a nutritional food that can actually reduce rates of chronic liver disease and improve outcomes. Enroll those who are at risk for surveillance, regular surveillance um, with ultrasound and alpha fetoprotein, at least for hepatocellular carcinoma. And then we know that earlier diagnosis results in much more effective treatment. Thanks very much. That was really a, a great presentation, Dr. Roberts. Uh, and uh, I'd like to now move on to the next speaker uh, who has made great efforts to join us. Uh, this is Professor Mahmoud El Matani uh, from uh, the Ain Shams University in Egypt, who's going to present on the feasibility of liver transplantation in Africa. Uh, Professor El Matani is the president of El Ain Shams University uh, and therefore extremely busy, and we really do welcome him here today to talk about this subject. <laughs> 